My name's Andrew McColl. I'm the Queensland Director of Family Voice. And today we're going to be talking to Bettina Arndt on the subject of feminism's hostility to men. Bettina is a well-known conservative commentator who's been writing and speaking for decades about feminism, its impacts on society and its effects on males. She doesn't mind being controversial and commonly that's a good thing. So my plan for today is to put some questions to Bettina and in the latter part of our one hour session, my family voice colleague, Daryl Budge from WA will be taking some questions from viewers for Bettina. So good afternoon, Bettina, and welcome to our Family Voice Zoom session. Thank you, Andrew. And well, it's a great pleasure to be here and saying hello to Daryl as well. <laughs> great. So just quoting you, Bettina, for a moment, which is always a, well, normally a fairly safe place to start with people. You wrote that uh, traditionally marriage involves a kind of bartering rather than mutual interdependence or role sharing. Husbands financially and economically supported wives while wives emotionally, psychologically and socially supported husbands. He brought home the bacon. She cooked it. He fixed the plumbing. She the psyche. But Tina, could, could you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, if you think about that traditional relationship, it's now discredited. I mean, it's now presented as an appalling state of affairs where the women were really miserable and popping ballium and, and you know, uh, and men had it all their way in, in that traditional situation. And, of course, um, arguably, I would say, you know, there were probably a lot of happy people in that traditional relationship, just as there are now. I mean, it's got, but it's gotten much more complicated. And of course, the big shift has been um, women in the workforce. Uh, majority of women spending at least some of their adult years working either um, full time or part time when they have children, um, and that's changed the whole equation. Of course. Um, <laughs> I think the major result of that is men are always in trouble now, whereas they used to get credit for what they did and got credit for earning the bread. And, you know, don't bother your dad. He works really hard. You know, we have to look after him. There was an assumption that the traditional male role had to be appreciated and the family had to look after him because of that. And, and now the minute he walks in the door, he has a tea towel thrust in his fa face and is told he's not doing enough. You know, I think it, it's really interesting that because women, more women are working, um, the way the men are now expected, of course, to contribute in all these other ways. It's no longer good enough for her to be the king keeper where she looked after all his relatives and she bought all the presents, and she, she wrapped the presents at Christmas. He's expected to contribute in all these traditional areas as well. And I just think men are endlessly in trouble in their marriages. And no matter what they do, an awful lot of men don't get much appreciation. Mm. So when you were interviewed by John Anderson about 15 months or so ago, you mentioned then to him that uh, feminism is all about advantaging women at the expense of men. It's caught up in the demonization of males. So what do you think, Bettina, are the Australian manifestations of this phenomenon? Um, well, I don't think they're particularly different in Australia from, you know, America, <laughs> the Western countries, the sure. same patterns have actually emerged. Yeah. Um, well, let me sort of expand on what I was talking about earlier. Uh, we, we look at the issue of, well, I'll go back, I'll tell you about a little story. I once wrote an article about who gets the better deal in marriage. And I went out to men and women and said, you know, who do you think is better off? And it, what was striking is how many men said, look, I know she, I'm going to be in trouble. I know she's going to say I don't do enough. And it was always around housework that men uh, feel or, they're always on the back foot for not doing enough to help her, looking after the kids, you know, looking after the house. And um, the women um, tended to agree that men weren't doing enough. So it was this idea that no matter what men were doing, they weren't, they were 
in trouble. And of course, year, every year for uh, for many years, well, we have we used to have a, a big um, survey. Well, it was actually couple, every couple of years a survey released by the Bureau of Statistics around who actually does what around the house, and um, so that was the time use survey. And of course, what they always got headlines saying how, you know, men are lazy sods, they're not doing enough, and the women are the ones who are working so hard. And they never added up the amount of paid work hours plus unpaid work. They'd only compare the work around the home for men and women. And of course, if you add paid plus unpaid work for years and years and years, we've seen pretty much the same equation where it's almost on par. Men and women do about as much to contribute to their families and their households. Um, you know, a different combination of paid and unpaid work, but men never get any credit for that. And that's just one example of innumerable areas where the whole cultural na narrative is demonizing men, is presenting men as not contributing properly and presenting women as hard, badly done by and missing out in all sorts of ways. Yeah, sure. So according to the Australian, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, our male suicide rate is overall three to four times higher than the female rate and mainly involves men in midlife. And these are the major predictive factors about suicide, being male, being divorced, widowed or separated, living alone and being unemployed. Do you think that these much higher rates of male suicide can be related to perceived our perceived attitudes in our community. Um, I think that, that well, that's it's all tied in together in a sense, because the sort of issues that drive men to suicide are the sort of issues that have um, tilted the balance in our family law system, for instance, away right. from men. Yep. Um, the family law is actually the big issue fascinating this year for the first time the bureau of statistics had coroner report data um showing that the major cause of suicide for this big group of uh what i'd call family men men in their 25 to 45 that sort of age group where they tend to have young children the biggest group of uh, the biggest risk of suicide is family breakup and and of course you know so the demonization of men leads to the our uh, family law system being set up in such a way that it's really easy for a woman to, if she wants to shut the man out of her life, she can do so if, when the marriage is breaking up. All she has to do is make an, a false allegation of domestic violence or sexual abuse, and a good chance he'll be immediately removed from that home, um, deny contact with children for years. When he gets to the point of being able to have contact with the children, he has to pay for supervised contact. Uh, you know, and here we have in black and white on our ABS um, website, the fact that this is a major cause and our national suicide bodies don't even name men as a key risk group for suicide. They name indigenous men, they name disabled men, they name elderly men, but they refuse to acknowledge that six of the eight people who commit suicide every day are male and that this family breakup is the key cause at the moment because they don't want to go there. They don't want to look at what's happening in our family law system and why we've given women far too much power to destroy men's lives. Wow. I came across a, a, a quote of Augusta Zimmerman when he, he wrote not that long ago that the Victorian Labor government has invested an unprecedented $2.6 billion to prevent family violence and keep women safe. But no mention is made of protecting men against domestic violence, although it has been officially reported that at least one third of the victims of domestic violence are men. We know also for sure that violence against men is a seriously underreported crime. Why would this be? Well, the big, the biggest fundraiser for the feminist movement in Australia is domestic violence. 
it's been extremely effective means of gaining resources for the women's movement. And we have domestic violence organisations across Australia pouring out propaganda that absolutely deny uh, women's role in family violence. In fact, the international research, we've got 50 years of research showing that women are just as likely to be perpetrators of domestic violence, of interpersonal violence, uh, intimate partner violence as, as men are. And women are more likely to initiate violence than men are. Um, and we never see this discussed in our official organisations. When, when our a government organisation mentions domestic violence, they never talk about the male victims. They never talk about the fact that we have a lot of women who are dangerous, not only to the men, but to their children. Right. Women on ice, women on drugs, women with mental health problems. And there are men all over Australia who are stuck in violent relationships and won't leave because they're too nervous of leaving. They know they can have no hope in our family court system of taking the children with them to, in order to protect them from this violent woman. And they stay in that violent situation, because, A, because they know they won't be believed if they go to the police and talk about what's happening to them. And there is nowhere for them to go. All our big organisations are wanting to keep the money entirely for them. Uh, the women, the feminist organisations, all the resources go to, to women, to women's refuges, to supporting women um, who are victims of violence. And we don't, you don't give a single cent of government money to protecting males from, from violent relationships. And it's absolutely appalling. So you did. Do you think there's a bias in the reported research that doesn't properly report female violence? Oh, no question. The international research, there was a big international research study that put together all the papers that have been published up to that stage, the proper peer-reviewed papers looking at rates of violence for men and women, uh, and they had 1,700 peer-reviewed studies that show the sort of pattern I've been discussing, where violence is two-way involving women as well as men. We never see that discussed. We constantly see any research that shows this pattern of male and female violence, it's always hidden. Um, there was a, a Monash University just recently published a study of adolescent violence that found 23% of females and 14% of males. Um, these were 16 to 20 year olds reported being violent towards a member of their family. So many more female adolescents being violent. This is something that emerges again and again. And one of the big issues that complicates matters is that, I mean, for instance, we have a, a personal safety survey, which is the major cause, major um, survey where we analyze who calls themselves a victim of, of domestic violence. And we find that's where that one third figure comes from. So a third of the people who, who say to be victims of violence through that national survey are actually male. Now you get a very different result if you don't, if you go out and say, not who are, who are victims of violence, but who are perpetrators. Because men don't want to acknowledge being victims. They feel it's denigrating to acknowledge they're a victim of violence. But women happily, a lot of women who are violent happily acknowledge that. And so if you go out and ask men and women who are perpetrators of violence, you get that 50-50 ratio. And that's what's showing up in this adolescent survey. That's what's showing up in all sorts of bits and pieces <laughs> that emerge uh, in, uh, you know, by researchers across Australia. <clears throat> and yet that never gets official, discussed in our official documentation, which is all about getting more money for the women's groups and the women's, uh, you know, centres and the women's refuges and denying that, that men could be victims. Right. So just turning to the whole matter of education for a minute, you've also mentioned that feminist ideology infiltrates all our education systems, systemic programs to continue to advantage girls, and no one taking any notice that boys are falling out in huge numbers. So, so, so how did you come to that conclusion? Well, that's what the official data has shown for many years. Um, the new, recent New South Wales statistics on, on uh, success of, of boys and girls um, showed that boys are actually a disadvantaged group, the most clearest disadvantaged group when it comes to education in Australia. 
Where have you seen that? Where have you seen that discussed? It's just never mentioned. Years and years ago, like 20 years ago, I wrote an article about the fact that boys were starting to fall aside, fall behind. And I made, I was talking to a very senior education bureaucrat and I said to her, look, you know, it's a fabulous thing that women are doing so well. You know, the, the girls are absolutely shining as a result of all the efforts we've put to help advance girls' education. <clears throat> And I, but I said to her, well, what we're seeing, but also is the boys are falling behind. The boys are filling the remedial classes. The boys are dropping out of school. What are we going to do if the gap continues to widen? And this, this female bureaucrat gave a big laugh and said, uh, well, we'll wait 2,000 years and analyse the results very, very carefully. <laughs> and she presented it as if it was a big joke. And of course, that's exactly what they've done. This data has been emerging for decades and they've absolutely refused to acknowledge it, let alone do anything about boys' education. And we have had a number of parliamentary inquiries in Australia. There was a New South Wales one on oh, decades ago and another federal one, uh, federal parliament, and they all have, you know, inundated by parents coming forward saying, I'm worried about the boys. All the, the girls are winning all the prizes every speech night. You know, my book son is really struggling, blah, blah, blah. And um, all these inquiries have had huge numbers of submissions. They've always made um, all sorts of recommendations about how we can address this problem of boys not being engaged in schools. And how much has that got to do with the way we've structured education to really play to girls the way girls learn best? Um, and what's happened is, I mean, in both cases, this was a, a conservative government that implemented these, these changes in policy and set up lighthouse projects and new ways of innovating to try to help boys. And the minute the Labor Party got in, that was all tossed out. The Labor Party has no interest in boys, no interest in men. They're only interested in advantaging uh, women and girls, and it, it is absolutely shameful. Right, yes, I, I, I came across the Men's Referral Service, or the MRMS from the New, New South Wales, which says that it provides free, anonymous and confidential telephone counselling, information and referrals to men to assist them to take action to stop violent and controlling behaviour. But actually, that was set up to also assist male victims of domestic violence. So why would you appoint a feminist organisation to assist male victims? It's not yeah. important. I mean, this was an organisation that proudly proclaimed that they, they were really good at working out who was the perpetrator. So if a man came along and said he was a victim of violence, they would work on the assumption he was probably a perpetrator. And what's utterly extraordinary is they would call... They would call the woman, the, they'd get details of the wife, and they'd check it out with her to see if his story lined up. Can you imagine if we if the situation was reversed and a female victim went along and they said, oh, well, we're bringing, we're bringing the hub, hubby to check this out. I mean, it would never happen. So these guys who are going along for help with domestic violence, putting up, dealing with a violent woman, are actually often being reported to the police and the assumption is made that they're perpetrators. Uh, Prue Goward, our former whatever she was, a community something or other, minister in New South Wales, um, she proudly announced, announced that this was going to be the first funding for male victims of domestic violence. She gave it all to the Men's Referral Service, which is all about trying to you know, hound out and work out which ones are perpetrators and making the assumption that most of these men are perpetrators. And it's Anyway, so it goes on. I mean, if you see a, if you see a politician in Australia claiming to do something for women for men, he's usually um, twisting <laughs> policies to ensure the money actually ends up with the women. Right. Can I give you my, one of my favourite stories about. <laughs> I mean, I I'm in just in awe at the audacity and brilliance of the feminist machine, and we saw this fully on display when COVID hit, first hit. You remember there was all immediately talk from all our women's organisations about women getting locked up with dangerous men. 
there was going to be a second pandemic of violence, they said. Um, and, you know, we need more money. We need to support women who are going to be shut in, in with these dangerous husbands. And so they went on and on and on in this, what was essentially a, a, a fundraising campaign. They ended up with 150%, our, our big domestic violence organisation got a 150% increase in their funding as a result of COVID, even when our official statistics, our police statistics, our ABS statistics showed there was actually a drop off in domestic violence. No one dared call that out and the money still went to increase the funding for domestic violence organisations. I mean, they're absolutely shameless. <laughs> okay. So do you think that that was the focus to some degree in the Johnny Deep Amber Heard trial, after which Deep claimed, and I quote, I also hope that the position will now return to innocent until proven guilty, both within the courts and in the media? Yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> I mean, I think it was a very important trial because we saw on display across for you know in front of millions literally millions of people across the world um amber heard's appalling coercive behavior and of course coercive control is the latest branch of the the domestic violence industry where it's actually a feminist academic cooked up this idea of this new form of domestic violence which is coercive control he invented it um it was only just over a decade ago, and he um, called it coercive control and said only, <laughs> only um, men are perpetrators of coercive control. And I've lost track of where I was heading with that story. Oh, yes, well, of course, yes, in fact, that Amber Heard was the classic example. I don't know whether you watched any of that. You know, she would follow him from room to room, screaming at him, belittling him, denigrating him. I mean, it was main, or some of it was physical, but it was mainly verbal, um, trying to control his behaviour. And, it, you know, that was shown around the world, which was absolutely fantastic. But here in Australia, we have had this huge campaign to present coercive control as the latest form of domestic violence. And shamefully, we had the, the dreadful tragedy of the Hannah Clark murder, the murder of this family mother and her three children, or well, homicide of these, this family, um, used to get to, to push through these laws by claiming the coercive, if the coercive control laws had been in place, that this tragedy might never have occurred. And there's, you know, it's interesting, coercive control was in, uh, introduced in Britain an, a decade ago, and there was no mention of this link to domestic homicide. It was absolutely made up by our feminist organisations to, to, to tear the, to, you know, to really pull on the heartstrings of this absolute tragedy and pretend that these laws will, will really help stop it, stop that sort of domestic homicide. And there's absolutely no evidence to support that. And funnily enough, what's happened in Australia, we've got Queensland and New South Wales have introduced, have got the domestic violence, the coercive control laws through parliament and they're sitting on them because they were, they're really nervous that, that women will be misidentified as perpetrators of coercive control. They said that. And therefore, what they're doing is having a big rollout of, of uh, policemen into uh, police officers, into uh, uh, um, police stations where they're there specifically to teach police that they're not allowed to charge women with coercive control. It has to be just men. I mean, talk about a propaganda exercise. And no one says boo. I mean, the politicians all just lie down and say, yeah, sure, bring it on, feminists. Whatever new laws you want <clears throat> to target men, we will applaud them. So just picking up that thought, do you think that that feminism today has a controlling influence over people. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would have thought I've, got, I've sort of made that pretty obvious. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, feminism today has infiltrated all our major organisations. Uh, they're, they're pushing out their view of the world through all our bureaucracies. You know, we have now 
in uh, we did an analysis recently of the public service, the federal public service. Most of the big departments have 60 to 70 percent women. Many of them are feminists. And you can see it in the policies there. They're pouring out. I mentioned um, I mentioned suicide policies. Four of the five beneficiaries of Australian suicide policies are women. Are women, despite the fact that six of the eight people who kill themselves every day are men. And this is because if you look at the, the group who is running that national suicide prevention body, they're all women. And they're women running all, all our health departments, all our key organisations, the psychology organisations, the, the lawyers, the, you name it. Um, <laughs> we've, we've, the whole of our bureaucracies are being captured and all the policies are falling into line. And that includes our justice system, unfortunately. Right. So uh, yeah, I saw a couple of days ago the, the WGA, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, has come out about wages, wages parity and how, how sad it is that we haven't got more women earning the big money. And I just, just happened to point out that 30 of the 32 employees there happen to be females. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, look at that. That's just classic, classic feminist propaganda full of lies, full of misrepresentation of statistics, where they're comparing apples with oranges, comparing, um, you know, men and women across di totally different types of, of um, work, play, work, you know, of jobs in the workplace, yep. and comparing men and women without looking carefully at, at the you know, amount of time they've taken out of work or whether they've had long periods working part-time or whatever it is. And the only way you get a wage gap is by ignoring all those key factors that really, are, you know, we, uh, who is prepared to do the really risky jobs and physically risky jobs in our society? It's still men and they get paid for that. I'd say, sure, you know, whether it's going down a mine or, you know, doing something very physically risky um, or something that's very inconvenient, flying in and out every second week or whatever it is, men are still doing those sorts of jobs and they get the larger salaries that are appropriate for those risky positions. Um, and yet, you know, we constantly pretend that the men and women should be earning the same money. BHP recently introduced policies to have 50% uh, women in mining camps. I mean, it's just nuts, absolutely nuts. And I did a, uh, I wrote a blog looking at, did a lot of research about what's actually happening there. Um, and of course, they've had to introduce all these, <laughs> they've introduced all these sexual harassment policies to monitor the people working at the mines to make sure they're not misbehaving with the women who they're pushing into that, you know, traditional, very traditional male environment. They've got drones following the men around to keep track of their behaviour. <clears throat> oh, you know, so it goes on. Pl um, firemen, you know, we had a, I can't remember, I think it was in Queensland, actually, the or was it? Yeah, I can't remember now. Head of the the fire services in in one of our states was wanting a fifty percent uh, female participation rate in throughout the fire services. And you look at what I get. Keep on getting letters from firemen telling me what's actually happening on the ground. I mean, the women tend to get pushed up very quickly into the managerial jobs. Have you noticed that almost every one of our services is now run by a woman? And if you went through and looked at what sort of, what, you know, the head of our police services, the head of our fire brigades, whatever it is, they're all uh, women now. And I bet if you lined up the actual experience those two, those people have had, very few of those women have the same on the ground experience with that particular job that they're supposed to be supervising. Yeah. And I have found here in Queensland that they try to run a 50-50 police force, 50 male, 50 female. But it became almost impossible because not so many women want to be police officers. And, and so you've got to lower the bar to get them in. And then when you get them in at a 50-50 at a rate, of course, ladies get pregnant. They want to go off and have their baby. Uh, ladies don't really relish the idea of going into a barroom brawl and saying, break it up, you blokes. So they don't want to get into that rough, rough and ready stuff, which the blokes don't always love, but they know it's part of the job. So well, they've got to... 
I, had to, I think we should say some women do. I mean, they're terrific female police officers who are tough and who got who would have got through the traditional um, training required for that job. And there are lots of women who can't cop it. And that's why they've had to, as you say, lower the standards. Um, I think we always have to point out there are some women who, who make, make the grade. But, but I've heard a policeman write to me and say, you know, my partner locked herself in the police car when there was a bit of trouble. <laughs> Um, or you know, or the or my my you know, a fireman saying, you know, she cannot carry the hose. I have to do it for her. All these, and of course, we're seeing increased injuries as a result of women trying to do the the sort of jobs that may be too difficult for some of them physically. Um, I mean, all of this is just madness. Yeah, and I I came across a quote of Erin Pizzi, and you may have heard of her. Women and men are both capable of extraordinary cruelty. We must stop demonizing men and start healing the rift that feminism has created between men and women. This insidious and manipulative philosophy that women are always victims and men always oppressors can only continue this unspeakable cycle of violence and it's our children who will suffer. So is Erin right? Oh, yes. I have to tell people about Erin in case they don't know who she is. She's actually just been given an award this early this year in the UK uh, by the government, finally. Um, 50 years ago, she set up the first women's refuge in London. And, um, and what happened was when... So she started setting up these refuges and she found that one of the problems in running these was the women who were coming coming into those places were often violent themselves. They were violent towards other women and violent towards their children. And Erin actually grew up with a violent mother. So she knows all about the cycle of violence and how that can be passed down through families. So she started speaking out about this issue and saying violence is two ways. It's not just males who are perpetrators of domestic violence. She had to leave Britain because of the threats she got from the feminists. Her dog was killed. She had death threats. Uh, they shut her down because they didn't want anyone saying women can be violent too. And she went to America for some years for her own protection. Uh, but she spent 50 years speaking out about the fact that, that men and women both can be violent. It's very often related to what they've witnessed growing up. And as she says, we're not going to break the cycle of violence unless we tell the truth about what children in our homes are witnessing. I mean, there are just as many children in Australian homes afraid of their mothers as they are of their fathers. And the evidence is there to prove it. We're, ch children are more likely to be abused by their mothers than their fathers. And that's partly because, of course, mothers do more of the caring. But there are also a lot of dangerous women out there. We never acknowledge that. And in fact, the statistics on abuse of children are being deliberately suppressed. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare used to publish um, regular analysis of data of gender of perpetrators of child abuse. And one year it was so obvious that, you know, that the men were are less violent towards children than the women on emotional abuse, physical abuse, everything except sexual, as you would expect. And um, they got there was a lot of discussion in the media about this. From then on, that institute has refused to publish information about the gender of perpetrators of child abuse. Now, how are we allowing this to happen? How are we allowing the feminists to censor our key organisations and stop them providing proper information about these issues? Good question. Erin <laughs> also mentioned that, quote, feminism will ultimately destroy the family. Do you think Erin's right? Oh, I think feminism is doing an awfully good job <laughs> of destroying the family already. Um, you know, what, one of the things that's happened through feminism as a result of feminism is Women have been taught to have, I think, ridiculously high expectations of their relationships and to always be so critical of their partners rather than looking for the good in their men. Um, we, we see as a, we're in a society where 
increasing numbers of women are miserable in their marriages. And that's the great irony. The result of feminism has been women are more unhappy than they used to be, particularly married women, which is the majority of women still. And you know, whatever else we've done for them, we've simply made things worse for them. If you look at that basic data on, on marital happiness, and it's because we're constantly telling them, you know, the grass is greener, that they should have this or that or the other, or why aren't they able to, you know, advance in their careers at the same time as having families or what, all sorts of unrealistic expectations. And the strain is enormous on families. Um, and as a result, marriages are very fragile. And in the middle of all of that are our poor children who are the real victims of the instability of the Australian family now. Yeah. You know, I've, I, I've noticed um, probably since about the 80s, when you look at media, when you look at movies and TV programs, you get more and more of this picture of almost every male is a bit of an idiot or yeah. incompetent or a bit of an oaf, can't turn up on time, doesn't know how to fix something, doesn't know what should be happening. And so the, the woman said, <clears throat> OK, well, I'll better do something about this. And if you get that that stereotype of males so frequently in in media upon say children, well, what do boys and girls think? Well, man, the blokes are not much good. Whereas if you went back to the fifties and sixties and looked at say movies that you watched, and I'm a bit of a Western fan of that era actually. Well, the males were competent, they were brave, they protected women who were obviously somewhat vulnerable and they were the heroes and they were such great role models uh, for men. But now all of that idea of, of the man who stands in the gap and says, you don't come through here and I'm protecting what's in my household. And all of that has been swept aside so that it's now the female who's saying, oh, you idiot, get out of the way, I'll fix this. And, and well, that's, it's, it's that's had a big impact. All that behavior is toxic masculinity. Yeah. You know, that's denigrated um, courage or, you know, resourcefulness or stoicism or all those traditional male qualities that, you know, we rely on in all sorts of circumstances. For, as I mentioned earlier, for, you know, men to cope with the really tough jobs in our society, yeah. uh, whether it's collecting the garbage to, you know, going out of the oil rigs or whatever it is, they're still out there and they're still called upon to kill the cockroaches. <laughs> you know, in, the, in the home, women are often very happy to resort to, uh, pathetically, it will be, I need someone to protect me <laughs> from that big huntsman in the corner. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, it's a very confusing world for me and I think a, a very depressing one um, because it's so rare that male qualities are presented as admirable. There was, a, you probably saw the, a very brave, um, I think she was a, a owner of a bookshop in Melbourne, owner of a string of bookshops in Melbourne, speaking out about she's sick to death of all these books that denigrate males and, and don't present males in any sort of positive light. I um, mean, she didn't quite put it like that, but that was the su sort of subtext. Um, that all this woke stuff, hardly anything which presents a normal fa people with a normal family with a mum and dad and, you know, endless poor me type stories. I am so, I can't find anything to watch on television. I can't find any movies to go to because it's always the hero women, you know, Barbie is the classic example. And as you say, the hero women and the stupid men. And I just cannot watch it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can understand that because I, I felt the same. And uh, so just coming back to as we as we think about this and you've written that uh, we need to start calling out feminism, which is really a destructive force in our society, unquote. How can we set about doing this? Well, I think we need to have conversations at a community level. I mean, everyone in their own family environments has to get braver at talking openly about this. I know... You know, if you have a sympathetic friend, you might whisper to him and say, what do you think about this? But very few people in mixed groups dare to 
openly talk about these issues. And we're not talking about men speaking up. We're also particularly talking about women. I think there, I find there are just as many women as men concerned about the, the, you know, the sort of trends we've been talking about. There are mothers of sons who are desperately worried about bringing up boys in this anti-male culture where the males are so vulnerable, uh, you know, whether it's being discriminated against when it comes to a job or have the teachers only teaching to the girls in the class and tr treating the boys as the troublemakers or whether it's um, being accused of sexual assault. One of the key areas I work in is supporting but often boys, these are often men under 20 who are accused of sexual assault. And I've just, I've had, just had the tragedy of talking to a mother this week and her son was sent to jail for four years, a medical student, um, whose, whose girlfriend, well, he, he had sex with this girl um, who turned out to be two-timing her boyfriend and she pretended that she'd been raped by the, you know, by this woman's son because it got him, her off the hook in this relationship. And the whole of the court was full of this young man's, man's supporters who were just horrified that this girl's lies ended up with him being sent to jail for four years. This is happening across Australia. And it just breaks my heart. Um, and that's one of the major areas I've, I've been working in the last few years is to, is to talk about women think, mothers think, oh, I brought my boy out to be a good, good boy. He'd never get into trouble that way. Women are lying. They're lying to their girlfriends. They're lying to their, and then they lie to the policemen and then they lie to the court. They get caught up in this, you know, this story and then they can't get out of it. Well, yeah, and I, I, I guess speaking as a father and grandmother we're all involved in this in a in a, either a direct or indirect way because we're all involved with children mm. and uh so what our example with them both male and female is obviously hot, very important for them to be able to emulate if possible so i'd like to just uh, hand over to to my good friend and colleague daryl budge daryl have you got any questions from our viewers or yes i have a good handful of questions here 10 <laughs> questions thanks so much to the audience for asking some excellent questions um and patina i want to thank you so much for your hard advocacy on this issue over many <laughs> years it's very much needed so thanks for your excellent work and great research so um, the first question is some good news in terms of what, how can we reflect on that there's a bit of a backlash actually happening in regards to the trans movement and specifically on sport, bathrooms, prisons, etc. What kind of good news can we share about that backlash? Is there an actual tide turning in regards to those issues, regards to feminism, or is it kind of more of the same? Yeah. Look at feminism. Look, here's this issue where this tiny, aggressive lobby group decided to redefine what it meant to be a man and a woman, right? And then decided to, to lobby to allow so-called doctors to take the breasts of teenage girls who were confused about their gender. So we had that happening and the feminists said nothing for the first few years. They just ducked for cover. And now a few brave women who of course still call themselves feminists uh, have been speaking out about this but they were very slow to the party in the face of this utter outrage of the trans lobby and the fact that we've done so little to stand up to that but i have enormous admiration there's been you know uh, brave people emerging here and there you know doctors calling saying what we're doing here is atrocious um, researchers, nurses, whistleblowers of all sorts saying the way we are assessing the, these children uh, for these procedures is totally deficient and we're, we're taking enormous risks for their future by allowing them to, to go down that route towards sex change operations as teenagers. And, Oh, I just, I just think the whole thing has been utterly outrageous, but it's not my fight because I've got so many other battles to fight. 
Yeah, I was hoping other people would take that one on. And they are gradually, gradually. And I think we're seeing some changes. And, you know, there's been some very good journalists digging away, publishing the information about what the, the good researchers are actually saying about this and, and why the whole medical profession has been manipulated by these, these um, ideologues. I have a very foundational question here. Um, somebody asked about what is feminism as an ideology? And we could put it in a whole bunch of different ones. We could say it's a political ideology, it's a sexual ideology. We could say even it's a spiritual ideology. You know, some Christians like myself and Andrew would say it starts way back in Genesis that there was enmity created between Adam and Eve. And so it has this kind of spiritual element from the fall. Uh, how do you identify feminism as an ideology? And do you think it has links to communism and socialism as well? Um, I mean, it's the whole question of what is feminism and, you know, has it gone off the rails or has it, you know, I used to call myself a feminist because I thought feminism was about equality, about a level playing field between men and women. And that was, you know, as a young woman in, my, in the 1970s, you know, there was certainly work to do uh, to give women some of the opportunities they'd been lacking, whether it was in education or careers or whatever. Um, and therefore, I assumed when I got more and more involved in calling out what I saw as the excesses of feminism, that that it was a case for feminism having got off, got off the rails. But there's a very good Canadian scholar. She was a former a woman called Janice Fiamingo. She's a former professor of English, and she's been like me, calling out what feminism is doing for many years. But she's done a very important series this year on the history of feminism. And she points out that even the suffragettes were extremely anti-male. It was never just about equality. It was right from the beginning of the, the, that first wave of feminists. They were, they were actually very violent women. They killed people. They set off bombs that killed people. Um, they, you know, absolutely did, you know, had no restraint on how they fought this battle. And the targets were, were essentially male. Well, I, one of my slogans about feminism back in the, uh, amongst the suffragettes was they had a slogan, votes for women, chastity for men. And they always had a very strong desire to rein in male sexuality to denigrate male sexuality, to provide, to resent normal male sexual interest as something, you know, aberrant and, and disgusting. And so wave after wave of feminism has been uh, presenting normal male lust as a horrible thing, you know, whether it's, um, remember early days, we had the, the playboys and we had the, you know, women with sex objects if they wanted to appear in, skipping little outfits, selling cars, you know, one thing after another. Uh, what was it ultimately an attack on male sexuality? And then <laughs> the battle I got really involved in was the issue of um, women's right to say no in a marriage. And I wrote a book over a decade ago about what I see as a very alarming trend, which is that women feel absolutely entitled to have no sex in their marriage if they're not interested. And I have real problems with that. I think there are issues of obligation to caring for your partner in all aspects of your relationship, in a marital relationship. Uh, but to even suggest that now, your seat is, I was called, a, you know, a rape apologist for suggesting that women need to consider their husband's sexual needs amongst other needs. Um, so all of, the, all of this is tied up with the, the feminist movement demonising male sexuality has been one of the strong threads that has been there from the beginning. Um, what do you make of it being... Um, so we, we talked a, a bit earlier about family and the family being a pre-political institution. The family was the very first thing that ever existed and now we have government that's trying to take over whatever the family did and whatever the family did within its conscience that it had values and beliefs and fathers and mothers taught their children. But now it's the government's telling people how to behave. So do you see feminism as, as very much linked with a socialist ideology that 
government is now wanting to control what everyone thinks and does rather than everybody being self-governed. Feminism is perpetuated and its lies are perpetuated because of this ideology of the socialist agenda. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that before. Um, no question, feminism, most feminists are left wing, most of them are essentially Marxist socialists in their beliefs and have a vested interest in destroying the family. And they, they talk about that very openly, they see. And the early feminists talked a lot about that um, because they saw males as the patriarchy, males as the controllers, uh, the whole institution of marriage as a, as a damaging place for women to live their lives. And they've been out to destroy that in every way they can. I mean, and, 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 it, and it, they've done that very effectively, of course, by uh, providing enormous amount of support for women to leave their marriages and, and be on their own if they chose to do that. Um, and, you know, and as I've said, in the family court situation to to get men out of their children's lives, we've, we've just had a a new a big change got went through Parliament to the Family Law Act. And whereas Australia has been a leading light when it came to presenting fathers as important in children's lives, even after divorce, uh, we had this path-breaking research which said, you know, there had to be joint parental responsibility and that the family court was required to consider the possibility of shared care, you know, as a starting point and then move away from that if it wasn't appropriate. That's what we've had for decades. And that the Labor government has just pushed through de de legislation that throws out any mention of fathering when it comes to um, bringing up children. That's all gone. It's now all about protecting children from dangerous men. This is it. The pre men are always presented as dangerous to children, to anybody. And that, that's the violence card. And it has worked so well for fe feminism as a means of gaining control over our laws, gaining control over the family, gaining control for the women to get rid of the man out of the family. All you need is a domestic, as I said, a domestic violence allegation, and he's, the police will remove him from your home. You know, as we had a YouGov, you know, the big YouGov surveyors, they did a survey of um, levels of false allegations across, you know, umpteen countries internationally. Australia was second after India in the as the highest country in terms of levels of false allegations, and 40% of them related to the family law. We're a leader when it comes to false allegations, and that's all a result of um, feminism weaponizing domestic violence. So how do you think we can actually restore the sexes? You, you spoke a bit about in terms of restoring respect between the sexes. You spoke a bit about that, that we need to have public conversations. What about on the individual level? I mean, there's an excellent point that someone has made here that the best prayer I ever prayed was to believe, to believe for men as the spiritual head that they can actually be a protector and provider and carer at a spiritual level. And she said, the next best prayer is to pray to become the sort of woman that would be a worthy wife for a fine man. Both prayers were abundantly answered how can we help more women and I guess more men to want to pray those kind of prayers or to wish those kinds of things? See, that's, it's funny listening to that, the little thread of feminism left in me rankles because I don't need a protector. I was, I mean, I embraced this idea as a young woman that I would be able to look after myself. I was independent. I wanted a partner. I didn't want someone, someone on a day-to-day -day basis who was going to be my protector. I hoped I would protect him and look after him in all sorts of other ways. So I don't see it like that in terms of those traditional roles. Um, but I think, it, I, think, I think it can be much more reciprocal. And what, the great shame to me in terms of the damage done by feminism has been taking away from women that wonderful sense of agency we had uh, us old time feminists about the idea that we could look after ourselves and we could make our own way. And now, of course, the, the constant thread and a lot of the debates around women is women need protection. Women are potential victims. Women are always vulnerable to male aggression, to, you know, men, 
uh, it's a dangerous world. They need more safety. Um, and I think that's done enormous disservice uh, to women to present them as constantly in need of protection. And it's teaching women to think of themselves. It's a peculiar thing because it's teaching women to think of themselves as fragile and um, less capable of not only supporting themselves, but supporting someone else and caring for someone else. I mean, women are incredibly strong. Look how they look after their children. And look, you know, we know that. So why can't we celebrate that strength instead of seeing ourselves always as victims? Indeed, as, as being a victim, you're always potentially always looking for a saviour yeah. and perhaps looking for a false saviour too, and in, in that sense as well. And I see it as a place of good men will protect women against bad men because um, we're the ones that are strong enough to say, you can't do that, men, to these other uh, women. And for me, as a, as a husband and as a father of three little kids, and I've got one daughter, and I, I hope that I can be a good example to them. So, well, I'm sure your wife is also a strong woman. Yes, who's, oh, know, absolutely. Well yeah, she protected. has abilities that I don't have. <laughs> you know, I have women, I have mothers. We have an organisation called Mothers of Sons, which we set up because I have so many women contacting me worrying about their sons. And so this is an organisation of women who want to help our communities to understand what's happening to men. And they are all strong women, you know, and they are women who want to protect people. Um, so it's not just men who should protect. I mean, I think we are in this together. This is not just about men versus women. This is about men and women working together for a fairer world for yep. us all. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I certainly agree. Yep. Um, are there, is there any acknowledgement from domestic violence groups that uh, these claims are exaggerated? I mean, what institutions are actually calling out the lies where they exist? Is it only people like yourself, academics, that kind of seen that as fringe dwellers? Or are there institutions, major institutions, that are calling out the lies and exposing them, all the exaggerated claims? No, there are no major institutions calling out the lies. They wouldn't dare. I mean, and look, I really see Australia as a bit of a Stasi land. I mean, it's, it's a frightening world we live in. The researchers, I talk to researchers who say, I would lose my funding if I spoke out about this issue. Um, you know, we, I published recently a really interesting analysis from a, a former public servant, very senior man who was an expert in statistics and, and analysis. And he, when he left that job, has written this uh, analysis of this idea that the, there's only a tiny number of false allegations of rape. And he went and looked at what the what were the papers which concluded that there was only two or three percent uh, false allegations. And he looked at and he and he explained why it is that they deliberately tinkered with with the parameters. You know, they deliberately chosen all the way they, they adjusted the equation so it came out looking as if there was a tiny rate of false allegation when it, it probably is at least four or five times that. Um, but he wouldn't dare have said that. Dare have said that when he was in his big working in his big bureaucracy. Um, I mean, it just is everywhere. Someone yesterday sent me a letter from um, Edith Cowan University in in Western Australia, um, celebrating. You know, they've got a speaker coming to the university who's talking about how men have to deal with their aggressive behaviour. It's all to do with domestic violence he was a Samoan he came you know and he and it I think he had a woman who was going to appear with him it was also from New Zealand and they were talking about men's violence and men addressing their violence you know many years ago there was a really world-renowned research project called the Dunedin, Dunedin Longitudinal Study they'd been tracking families and children for decades looking at all sorts of issues to do with family development and there's a really interesting video somewhere where the researchers talk about when they went out to ask men and women about domestic violence and how these New Zealand women, including a lot of, um, you know, indigenous um, women, were asked, how, do you, who, 
initiates violence, you initiate violence, did your partner initiate? And just as many women came out and said they initiated violence. Those researchers published that paper and they were set upon. They nearly lost their positions. I talked to one of the professors like a decade later and she moved to America and she wouldn't even talk about it anymore because they got so much flack for telling the truth about domestic violence. I mean, it, it's just extraordinary what's going on. <laughs> and, you know, I have a few brave researchers who stick their heads up. <laughs> and of course, you know, in my case, I, uh, I'm sure you know, I, I was given an Australia Day honour two years ago for my services, particularly for advocacy for men. Within hours of that being announced, the feminists had prepared all this carefully doctored evidence, to bits of videos. So I've made, you know, 10 years of videos, YouTube videos. They took one minute here, two minutes there, put it all together to make me look like a horrible person who was denigrating women. And they went, they had, I had two attorneys general come out and denounce me and saying my award should be rescinded. The whole of Australia's Senate voted against me. I mean, they just piled on, which I regard as a real um, compliment in a sense. I'm clearly over the target. They decided I was too dangerous and they had to take me out. And the trouble was I'm not working. I've been self-employed for many years and they couldn't get me fired from a job. And when I, I should never have accepted that Australia Day honour because it gave them an excuse to have a go at me. And the fascinating thing is I was talking to the people in the Attorney General's office, in the Governor General's office who were monitoring this. They got thousands of people saying, you know, take that award from away from her, her. But they got just as many people supporting what I'm doing, which is something I've always known. If I go into a supermarket, I'll have a man or a woman come up to me and say, thank God you're out there. I couldn't, wouldn't dare say what you're saying. Now, what does that say about our society? You know, that we can't, what I'm saying is too dangerous because the feminists are in control. Yeah, so we need to encourage more brave souls out there to take up the research. And yes. keep it going in the decades to come. So yes. I just got one final question. Okay. I know we're close to the end of the time. Can you please provide some resources and websites and things that people can follow up and find more answers about these things? Um, well, I published, I, I have a website which has a lot of information on it. Just look under my name, Bettina Arndt. But I, what I'd really love people to do is follow my free blog. I have a blog on, on, on Substack. If you go to my website, you can sign up from there, but it's just Substack, which is the big writer's um, website. And I publish every couple of weeks, um, uh, either a, a discussion blog or a research-based blog. I have a team of researchers. I have all these retired boffins <laughs> who've come to me and said, what can we do? And they're statisticians and God only knows what. And they're all helping me dig and dig and dig and pull out the data that no one wants us to find out about. And so we're publishing information that's just not available anywhere else. So I want people to join up on my Substack, totally free, tell other people about it. Um, because I, I know I'm a very lone voice and I don't want to be. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've got 500 people who've written to me saying, what can we do? And I am working very hard to run campaigns I think last year I went to, to, to Canberra and talked to lots of me members of parliament about how we can give them the information they need to ask questions in parliament, uh, to burst the bubble, to, to expose the feminist conspiracy that's going on here. You know, that why, why is all our data being rigged? Why aren't we allowed to have data on this or that or the other? Um, and they, they don't have time or resources to put that together and we're going to do it for them. So I have big plans, but I need, you know, I obviously love a bit, a growing audience and, you know, people to have the courage to get out there and talk about all of this. Yeah, excellent, Bettina. Yeah. All so right. thank you so much, Bettina, for being with us today. I, I'm sure we've got an audience of men and women who are very grateful for what you've had to say today because what you're saying has been instructive and helpful for lots of people. So thanks again for your work over many years. 
uh, thanks for what you've done both for for men and women and, and for, actually for families. Uh, I, I first listened to you not that long ago and uh, I thought, wow, here's a lady who's got some goals to kick in life and she's doing great. So <laughs> thanks again. We, we, we appreciate all your work and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks very much, Andrew. And thanks, Cheryl, for your help. Uh, and to the audience, it's been lovely to have people participating. Thank you, Patina. Right, thank, thank you. God bless.